Welcome to the MegaCast. I'm Tyler Keith from the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, where you can also find us in the Birmingham Bloomfield area, on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, and on City Cable 15 of Southfield. Join us live on Channel 10 in Waterford every day on the Media Network of Waterford and live to tape on Channel 10 in Orion Township and Lake Orion on Orion Neighborhood Television or ONTV. You can also find us in, on the radio in the Birmingham, Bloomfield and Troy areas on the Biff Radio Network 88.1 FM The Biff, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. Find us online on our Facebook pages at Civic Center TV 15 and at Lakes FM, on our website at CivicCenterTV.com and on My Michigan TV or My My at MyMyTV.com where you can learn more about downloading their free apps for your smartphones and smart TVs. All that information is linked on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We can also find each and every one of our programs on demand. Then let's head over to our news page at civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news, where we have the links to the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 from reliable expert resources at the Centers for Disease Control, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the Oakland County Health Division to keep you up-to-date on everything you need to know about COVID-19, uh, in your community, including the spread of the virus, precautionary tactics you may need to employ, and where you can get vaccinations and booster shots should you be in need. Also on our news page at civiccentertv.com, we featured articles from many journalistic outlets across the state to keep you updated on COVID-19 and other stories making headlines all throughout the Great Lakes State. Our top story today is from the Detroit News' Mark Hicks. Dangerous heat is in the forecast for seven Michigan counties on Wednesday. Here's what you need to know about th that heat. Summer officially starts next week, but Southeast Michigan is about to bake in its warmest air of the year so far. Heat that could pose hazards for some residents. Wednesday could draw record setting temperatures thanks to a dome of high pressure reaching across the upper Midwest and Great Lakes, according to the National Weather Service. Quote, dangerous heat is expected tomorrow with temperatures peaking in the upper 90s and heat indices up to 100 to 105 degrees, according to the National Weather Service's station in White Lake Township via Twitter. The record highs for June 15th, that would be today, are 95 degrees in Detroit set in 1988, 93 degrees in Flint and Saginaw and the average high for this date is 80 degrees according to data from NWS. The heat index is expected to top the century mark between noon and 7 o'clock Wednesday according to the weather service. That is why meteorologists place much of the region under an excessive heat warning between noon and on Wednesday and 8 a.m. on Thursday. Quote, extreme heat and humidity will significantly increase the potential for heat related illnesses, particularly for those working or participating in outdoor activities in Livingston, Oakland, Macomb, Washtenaw, Wayne, Lenaway, and Monroe counties, according to the warning posted by the National Weather Service. Meanwhile, the heat advisory is in effect for much of the state Wednesday, including the Thumb and areas closest to the Saginaw Bay. The conditions prompted state officials to declare an ozone action day for the first time in the calendar year of 2022. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends people spend time outdoors, choose gentle uh, uh, exercises, and spend time uh, indoors and outdoors in the mornings and the evenings when ozone levels usually are lower. But there won't be much relief from the heat after dark. Overnight into Thursday, the mercury is expected to hover in the mid 70s with dew points around 70 also, keeping heat indices near 80 degrees, the Weather Service said. The average low this time of year is around 60 degrees, so about 20 degree difference higher is expected overnight tonight than the uh, average for the month of June. The night could bring other issues as well, the Weather Service said. Showers and thunderstorms could develop along and ahead of a front pushing east. Quote, there's a chance for showers and thunderstorms late Wednesday into Thursday morning with an isolated strong to severe th storm in the Tri-Cities, the Weather Service said. The, war the warm spell and unsettled weather won't last for long, however, they said. They say the Weather Service predicts Thursday to be slightly cooler with the thermometer topping out uh, at, in the upper 80s and falling between se below 70 degrees at night. Winds could gust as high as 25 miles per hour. Friday's forecast calls for more seasonable readings with highs reaching the low 80s under mostly scunny, sunny skies. The weekend could fare even better. Highs Saturday and Sunday are not projected to climb out of the 70s, the weather service shows. Overnight lows are expected to dip into the 50s on both of the weekend days. Also making headlines on our website at civiccentertv.com from the Detroit Free Press's Paul Egan. 
Uh, James Craig, former Detroit police chief, is suing the signature collectors over botched petitions, and Perry Johnson has also planned a lawsuit as well. Former Detroit chief of police James Craig is suing petition circulators over his botched nomination petition after he and four other Republican candidates for governor were disqualified from the August 2nd primary ballot over thousands of forged signatures. And Oakland County businessman and quality guru Perry Johnson, who was disqualified from the ballot as well over the same issue, is also planning legal action, campaign advisor John Yobe said on Tuesday. Craig, his campaign and campaign contractor Vanguard Field Strategies, which is an arm of Craig's campaign management firm Axiom Strategies, filed the lawsuit Monday in Kent County Circuit Court, according to records. Quote, my focus is getting to, to the truth. There are, a lot, there are a lot of unanswered questions. None of it makes sense to me, and closed quote, said the former chief. Named as defendants are Field Strategies, a Delaware-based company that Craig earlier identified as a campaign subcontractor, as well as 18 individual petition circulators who normally work as independent contractors. The suit alleges breach of contract, breach of warranty, and fraud. Infield Strategies not, did not immediately respond to an email seeking comment by the Detroit Free Press, but the company CEO Tommy Nepper told the Free Press earlier that it was another company hired as a subcontractor some contractor by his company that provided signatures the Craig campaign was concerned about. Craig has portrayed his campaign as a victim of fraud in arguing that his name should be allowed on the ballot. Craig's legal arguments were rejected by the Michigan Supreme Court and he is now pursuing a write-in campaign to continue his, uh, his competition for governor. Craig's suit alleges that, th that Enfield, quote, secretly and, quote, recklessly subcontracted with a company he'll Ahead, he did, uh, headed by Sean Wil Wilmoth of Warren, who has a criminal conviction related to signature fraud. The company connected with Wilmoth used uh, the company that connected with Wilmoth used another man identified in the lawsuit as Willie Reed as a quote unquote front. The suit alleges Wilmoth will, has not responded to phone messages from the Detroit Free Press. Neither Wilmoth nor Reed are named as defendants in James Craig's lawsuit. A report by the Bureau of Elections pointed to a Wilmoth camp a company as being linked to fraudulent signatures and former GOP gubernatorial candidates Captain Mike Brown of the Michigan State Police and Byron Center businesswoman Donna Brandenburg both said they hired Wilmoth to help collect their signatures. Johnson, like Craig, argued that each of the signatures has been uh, he submitted should have been compared individually with those kept in the qualified voter file and election officials should not have rejected all signatures submitted by circulators shown to have committed fraud. Johnson's suit also is a suit against the state board of canvassers, which refused to certify him for the ballot, were rejected in both state and federal court. That full article from the Detroit Free Press on our website, civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news. Finally making headlines there from Bridge, Michigan's Julia Forrest. Michigan blood donations are still lagging well be, uh, behind pre-pandemic levels. A blood donor shortage has emerged during the pandemic and has continued in Michigan and across the country. The American Red Cross declared a national blood crisis in January, citing that it was seeing its worst shortage in more than a decade. At the time of the declaration, the Red Cross noted that it has seen a 10% decline in donations since the beginning of the pandemic. Low blood supply has caused doctors to conduct more screenings for patients to see if more or less blood work is necessary. It has also caused hospitals to consolidate their stockpiles and transfer their blood supplies to other facilities that may be more in need. Quote, the, st the scary part about blood products is there's no alternative, and close quote, said Nicholas Decker, laboratory director for the Mem Memorial Healthcare in Owasso to Bridge, Michigan. He continued on by saying, we need it, we have it, or we don't have it, and close quote. After blood donations and supply dropped to dangerously low levels in January, doctors in charge of blood banks around the state are seeing a new uptick in donors, but still not to pre-pandemic levels. Quote, we were quite concerned that we would potentially be reaching a critical situation. We got close, but never quite hit that, said Rob Davenport, director of transfusion medicine at Michigan Medicine in Ann Arbor to Bridge, Michigan. Continuing on, Davenport said, quote, it now has improved. However, things are not back to normal, and closed quote. There still remains a shortage of O-negative blood type, 
Uh, o negative, of course, is typically used in blood transfusions and can be used universally, but for people with O negative, there are no substitutes. Quote, the, con the need continues, Davenport, Davenport said. Blood supply is a critical piece of medical care. Unless we as a community continue to support blood donations, people are going to suffer. According to Decker, the lab director in Owasso, doctors have begun looking for more additives to extend the lifespan of blood products. Summer lulls and donations are also being preempted by the opening of blood donation areas in northern Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. Doctors are further prioritizing ways to reach in rural communities and boost minority donors. Davenport noted that the best way to boost participation in minority communities is by, quote, being open and honest, and close quote, acknowledging that the health care system has not always served those communities correctly and focusing messaging on building trust within the community. People like Wood, who needed transfusions as a child, Wood, of course, referenced early on in this article posted on a website, know how important it is to have adequate blood supplies. Quote, there's always going to be a need for it. It takes less than an hour if you get in there and you do all the procedures correctly and on time. It's always something I would venture to say is worth trying. All those headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com slash local hyphen news, as well as those ever helpful links to up-to-date and accurate information from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division regarding COVID-19. We have a great program ahead on this Wednesday edition of the Oakland County MechaCast. Coming up next, Tony Targan and Brooke Allen from the Farmington Players will join us. And then at the bottom of the hour, the Birmingham Shopping District's Erica Bassett joins us. That's all up next on the Oakland County MechaCast. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 72.7% of high school students get less than the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent seven to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program and 89.3 Lakes FM. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com where you'll find information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV. Joining us now from the Farmington Players, we have a couple of individuals joining us, Tony Targin and Brooke Allen join us on the program where they will be hosting the Farmington Players One Act Festival June 24th through 26th at the Farmington Players. Thank you both for being with us today. Hey, Tyler. 
Thanks good for having me. With, yeah, good having you both with us today. So, Tony, let's start with you. You helped create the first one-act festival at the Farmington Players back in 2019. What inspired you and, and others at the Farmington Players to create this specific festival? Well, I think there's a real um, wealth of talent in Michigan, um, both among playwrights and actors and directors. And we have a group of uh, a playwriting group at the Farmington Players, and we just wanted to nurture uh, part of our mission, which is to encourage and develop um, writing talent. So a number of smaller local theaters have one act festivals, and I thought it was something that we could could leverage and do well at Farmington as well. Over the years that this has been active in the uh, Farmington Players, of course, with COVID-19 uh, being a consideration, uh, I'm sure it hasn't been necessarily going on as you intended it to go on when it began in 2019. But for those that have participated, both as an audience member and those participating in the One Act Fact Festival uh, performing themselves, what's the reaction been from them so far uh, as this festival has run? Um, we've gotten a great reaction, um, both the first time we did it and even among this year's participants. Um, we have a lot of new new actors who are coming to the barn for the very first time. And we have a lot of um, long-term members who have maybe been away from the stage for 10 years or more. And you know, this is sort of a safe space that they can do something that's only most of the, most of the shows are 10 minutes in length. So it's a more manageable um, place for actors and, and budding directors to uh, sharpen their skills. Uh, we also are joined by Brooke Allen. And Brooke, uh, you, our audience might know you from on the radio, <laughs> from WWJ, or from your time here at our flagship TV. Of course, yes. TV. But you also have a, a pretty extensive background in acting. What, what is your acting background and what led you to this festival in Farmington? Well, you know, it's kind of like what Tony said, as far as the One Act Festival, it's a lot different than doing a full-blown show where you're in rehearsal for, I don't know, eight weeks, um, three times a week. This has been a little bit of a different process. And, you know, I haven't been on stage in about 10 years, so um, I'm excited to be back. Of course, I was supposed to be in a show right before the pandemic and that got shut down. So all my hopes were dashed then, but I'm uh, super excited to be in this One Act Festival. And so, Tony, Brooke is going to be a big part of this year's One Act Festival at the Farmington Players uh, in an award show format. Tell us about that format <laughs> and what really went into the decision to have an award show format be incorporated into the One Act Festival. Well, I had um, seen another festival in Wisconsin in where one of my plays was being performed. And um, they didn't do an award show, but they did sort of intersperse little comic vignettes in between the scene changes. And I just thought it would be a way to keep our audience engaged. And, um, you know, naturally when I thought of, of involving Brooke, I thought, well, you know, this is something that she, given her background in the entertainment industry could, could pull off. So we've actually created a, a fictional character, River Allen, which is <laughs> Brooke's identical twin sister. Very convenient. <laughs> will be the award show host because Brooke is also going to be busy acting in um, one of the other plays, which is called It Goes Without Saying. So she's pulling double duty um, so we can leverage the most of her talents. <laughs> so Brooke, this is a, a news and a talk show at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I have to go right. more on the news side here. Okay. How do I know I'm not talking to River right now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, River's kind of full of herself. So you'll know when you're talking to her, trust okay. me. That's it. It's good to have someone more full of themselves to host an award show. <laughs> award shows are in and of themselves so indulgent. So that'll be, exactly. that'll be something interesting. Can you tell us about the character, more about the character of River and how that's going to help incorporate all these other one act plays into this festival? So um, it's not just me. There's Jim, who's the co-host. So there's two of us. That is um, his name is Lake. So you've got River and Lake uh, hosting this award show. Um, two very different characters, but, you know, we're uh, very good friends. And by the end of it, you know, we have a pretty decent relationship. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, it's just fun to to be not myself and then to actually uh, transition to one of the shows. So um, it's a bit challenging for me, but I, you know, we've got another week to go. So Tony, hang in there, we'll get it done. <laughs> so Tony, back to you. Uh, tell us about some of the one act plays that will be featured in this year's festival. What, to, if people are interested in attending June 24th through 26th, what are some of the plays they can expect to see? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd love to give you a little more detail on that. We actually have eight 10 minute comedies. They're mostly about relationships, okay. um, romantic or otherwise. And we have 23 actors that are playing the 28 roles between those eight plays. Some actors are double cast. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, Literary Virus is a play about a strange affliction that affects only writers who meet in a coffee shop. Beware the Ides of Mars is a sci-fi comedy that takes place on a Martian space station. Um, I'm Fat is a very creative comedy where um, a person's fat in literal form comes to move in with them. And they weren't expecting that character to become part of their life, but um, fat is very hard to get rid of once it shows up. Another um, sort of absurdist humor is called Small Talk by David McGregor, which um, involves a couple that goes to marriage counseling because the, women, the woman, the wife, has the uh, inability to make casual conversation. Um, then we have um, some that are a little more on the serious side. We have a play called Ahava, which is the Hebrew word for love. And it's a play about a Jewish man that's preparing to introduce his non-Jewish girlfriend to his family after his grandmother's funeral, when he might have told a few fibs about um, who she is and what his own um, career success or lack thereof has been. So it's that anticipation before meeting the family. Then we also have It Goes Without Saying, which is the, sh the play that Brooke is in, and that involves a husband and wife that are actors in a community theater play and a director who's trying to get the most out of their performance. Um, and then the last two are um, what we're calling blind date plays. One is I'm Not Wearing Any Pants by yours truly, which is a... Um, a meeting between a Russian woman and an American man and some of the misunderstandings that occur due to their language barriers. And last but not least is Driveway Dating by Jennifer Ward, which is a blind date that occurs in someone's driveway. So um, there's a, a wide range, but the, uh, again, they're all comedies. They're all about 10 minutes and um, some are a little more far-fetched than others, but I think they all um, they all hold together very well. We chose these eight from over 70 submissions from Michigan Playwrights. So we like to think that we have the, the cream of the crop. Um, and I don't know, Brooke, if you want to add more about the play that you're in, but um, I, I think they're all delightful comedies. They are, you know, and it's so cool to be uh, uh, able to be doing these original, these are original plays. So they may have been read before, but they haven't been really staged before, I don't think. So it's kind of cool to be one of the first actors to be doing one of these. So I'm, you know, really proud of that and the fact that they're all Michigan playwrights. More information can be found on the Farmington Players One Act Festival by visiting the website farmingtonplayers.org. That's farmingtonplayers.org. Festival June 24th through 26th at the Farmington Players, and you can also get tickets on the website as well. Again, farmingtonplayers.org for more information or call the box office number 248 553 2955. That's 248 553 2955 for more information on the One Act Festival and more. And so, uh, Brooke, as you're developing your characters, particularly River, did you mm -hmm. use any of uh, uh, did you take any anything from the personalities that you've encountered in your media career and incorporate those into this host character of yours that is River Allen? It's all you, Tyler. It's oh. all you. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of thing that will annoy people right off the stage. That's, that's a good transition. It's all you. When I, you know, when I channel River, I channel you. <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know what? Honestly, it's a little bit, it's probably a little bit of everybody, right? Maybe even a little tiny bit of myself. I'm not sure. Just a little. <laughs> Just a little. We're yeah, the best, about Brooke best actors. And... Yeah, the best actors draw from their own experience and personalities. <laughs> and not to say that you have to be a med method actor to succeed, but it should feel natural. And um, I think that the two hosts, Lake and River, have a really nice rapport. Uh, we also have a couple of actors that are playing. Um, audience members who interrupt things and demonstrate bad behavior. So that's uh, a little bit of comic relief. So um, River and Lake will try to keep them in check. We're joined by yes. 
Brooke Allen, not to be confused with her twin River Allen, and Tony Target Correct. from the Farmington <laughs> Players joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. Their one act festival at the Farmington Players, June 24th to 26th. You can get more information on the website, farmingtonplayers.org. Tony, uh, for those that will be attending or plan to attend after hearing this or watching this, what, what sort of pro, uh, COVID-19 protocols, if any, are still in place at the Farmington Players so that they're aware of what they need to be, what precautions they need to be taking before they go? Yes, um, we are requiring that all audience members wear masks. We are no longer requiring audience members to show proof of vaccination, although most of our patrons are already vaccinated. Um, in addition, anyone at the barn who's either in the cast or on the crew is fully vaccinated. So we feel pretty comfortable um, that um, we can offer a safe environment for our patrons and for our, our cast and crew. We're joined by Tony Targan and Brooke Allen from the Farmington Players. The One Act Festival at the Farmington Players is June 24th through 26th. You can get more information on the website, farmingtonplayers.org. Before we let uh, both of you go today, anything else that we should know about the One Act Festival that's coming up in just a couple of weeks uh, before we let you go or anything else we haven't talked about related to the Farmington Players? One, uh, one aspect that is new this year is that we're actually having the audience vote for their favorite play. Um, the People's Choice Award, and the winning uh, playwright will receive $100 and the honor of being the first winner of our People's Choice Award. So we're asking all audience members, even if they, they're coming to see their friend or family in one of the casts, to um, basically watch all the plays and at the end of the evening, vote and uh, pick the winner. You can learn more information by visiting the website farmingtonplayers.org where you can also get tickets to the One Act Festival. Tony, Brooke, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Take you. Take care, Tyler. Appreciate it. More information can be found on the website farmingtonplayers.org and you can also call the box office to get tickets as well. 248-553-2955. That's 248-553-2955 for more information and to purchase tickets. We're going to take a break on the Oakland County Megacast. When we come back, we'll go from Farmington to Birmingham. We'll speak with Erica Bassett from the Birmingham Shopping District. That's coming up next. You're watching the Oakland County Megacast. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's organ donor registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211, get connected, get help. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council, 
We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was going to die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves, and all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is a source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. 
If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Michigan has a wealth of, of cities with walkable downtowns and exceptional shops for all tastes and interests. One of Oakland County's finest walkable shopping cities is the city of Birmingham. And here to give us the scoop on all the shops is Erica Bassett from the Birmingham Shopping District. Erica, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you. It's been a while and I'm happy to be back on the show. Yeah, good to have you back with us. So the last time we spoke to you, to you uh, we also spoke to, about the about some things going on in the Birmingham Shopping District. That was in some of the colder months of the year. So as we slowly, slowly make our way toward the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, hopefully, but uh, at the very least into a maybe less severe era of the COVID-19 pandemic, how are things changing in the Birmingham Shopping District? Particularly, how is traffic changing and uh, staffing for these businesses? Yeah, well, it's certainly nice to see people out and about again. I mean, it was such a big change from just about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, so we're seeing a lot of foot traffic. Our businesses have been really busy, both for shopping and dining. Uh, I guess as anywhere, uh, there is sometimes a challenge in finding employees, but they're they're able to work their way through that. And it's really just been bustling, you know, which happens like you mentioned with the warmer months. So people are interested in getting out and about again. And the, the wonderful thing about Birmingham is that everything is so walkable. So whether you're coming down to browse the shops or to dine outdoors, uh, it's really just a great place to, to come and be outside. and and walk around. So we're, we're seeing just that added foot traffic uh, through these nice weather months so far. Knowing that this time of the year is so critical to these businesses, it's their highest traffic time of the year. People love to go to Birmingham from Oakland County and from surrounding areas coming into the county to go to these shops, to explore everything that Birmingham has to offer. And so during the pandemic, for safety purposes, so many cities, especially with walkable downtown areas like Birmingham, were providing that additional access to city space, sidewalks, sometimes the streets to expand outdoors during regular business. Is that something that's going on in Birmingham again this year, something that's been discussed about possibly putting into effect in Birmingham to really give that momentum to these businesses as they're getting to a point that's been arguably the the greatest potential having the greatest potential that we've seen in years because of COVID-19. Yeah, we're certainly, you know, as a city and also as a shopping district doing all we can to support our businesses. Um, as you mentioned, many of the businesses down here are locally owned. Um, that's both restaurants and, um, you know, our retailers. So we definitely are trying to work with them and do all that we can to allow for uh, you know, for them to utilize that outdoor space. Many of our restaurants already have outdoor patios. And if you've been down here at all in, in the last couple of weeks, you can see that those are open in full force. Um, some of our restaurants actually have um, sort of an in-out space. And then also um, we have a rooftop space at one of our restaurants. So um, people really enjoy that outdoor dining. And it's nice to see that, you know, starting to, to come back. Um, as far as retail, you know, most of the retailers are indoors, but, you know, you'll find in the warmer months, retailers love to um, pop their doors open and just have traffic go and the nice airflow. So it's really a wonderful time to, to be down here. And of course, you know, we're doing everything we can to support these businesses as they need it. And one of the great things about Birmingham that I really enjoyed uh, in, the, in the times I've visited it during the pandemic, I went down there to watch a couple of games at one of the, at one of the bars with a couple of friends of mine. And what was great is you had uh, you had free parking available in many of the in many of the uh, in many of the parking garages. Is that something even on a limited time basis that's going to continue on as we go forward uh, to give some of that opportunity for people to take some time and really explore? all of that downtown area or as much of it as possible without being worried about, I have to go back and refill my meter. 
Sure. You know, and that's always something that we've tried to support um, our visitors with. So Birmingham downtown has five municipal structures. And in those structures, we always offer the first two hours of free parking. So you can come, drive in, you know, pick the structure that's closest to the area that you, you know, you're dining or shopping in. And then um, your first two hours is free. So if you head back before then, there's nothing that you pay. Um, but if you decide to stay longer, which we hope that you do, it's just $2 per hour after that. So, um, and I believe the maximum is $10. So um, Birmingham, you know, parking is very affordable. And as I mentioned, we do have those five structures that are really conveniently located um, throughout our downtown. But we also do offer metered parking throughout downtown. That's affordable as well. Um, that does not have the free first two hours, but um, but it is affordable and it's more for short-term parking. And then of course on Sundays, parking is always free. So city parking at meters and in those structures is free all day. So, you know, Sunday's a great time. We have our farmer's market on Sunday. Um, if you wanna come down, stay a while, play at the park, walk around, it's a great time to explore. And we talked about some of the uh, restaurant institutions there that are independently owned, that are unique to Birmingham. One of those, uh, Dick O'Dow's, a, 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 a classic Irish pub, went, underwent some renovations recently. Can you tell people about what those renovations are and, and how that's added to the experience of this pub in downtown Birmingham? Yeah, so Dick O'Dow's has been in downtown Birmingham for over 25 years and they're really a beloved um, establishment for both locals and then even people coming from a little bit further away. Um, they are a traditional Irish pub, so when you enter the front, you've got that whole um, kind of darker wood Irish feel and it's really unique. Um, but then uh, about a few years ago on the back, they added the Dow, which is a more modern space. There's outdoor dining back there, fire pits. Um, it's really a great atmosphere. And then most recently, um, they're finishing up a renovation on the front facade, and that includes a fireplace as well, some outdoor seating, uh, and it looks really great. So that's something that if you haven't been to Dick O'Dow's recently, you'll definitely want to pop in because they've got a lot going on there. And of course, they have that, that food and um, the, the Irish food, and then of course, the craft beer selection that people have loved for, for years and years. And they are locally owned as well. Yeah, it's a really fun place yeah. to go uh, if you're a Michigan State uh, athletics fan to go view some of their away games during the football season. I do that pretty often with some friends down there. Always a great experience at one of Birmingham's finest institutions. Uh, also going on in Birmingham this summer. It begins in just a couple of weeks on June 10th. The popular movie night series at Booth Park is returning. Tell, uh, tell our audience about what they can expect at, at this year's uh, festivities and, uh, and the return of the event. Any differences this year versus in the past? No, we're actually really excited to, you know, have these movie nights return this year. We were able to do a couple at the end of the summer last year, um, but we'll be able to do our full event series, um, which includes four movie nights, each in June, July, August, and September this summer. So we're looking forward to that. Um, they are held at Booth Park outside. So again, one of the great things about Birmingham, we have such beautiful outdoor spaces and we're able to host all of our events or most of them outdoors. So movie nights um, starting on June 10th will be featuring Sing 2, and families should plan to arrive at Booth Park around 6.30 p.m. for pre-show entertainment, and there's giveaways and sponsor tables. And then new this year, we actually have a large new LED screen that we'll be showing the movies on, and we'll be able to start them earlier. So movie times start at 7.30 p.m., which is great for, for families, especially with, with younger kids. So the movie nights, as I mentioned, will run June through September. So you'll definitely want to check our website. It's allinbirmingham.com slash events to see that event calendar and um, all of those movie nights. So, you know, just moving on to even July, we're featuring Home Alone, which is our Christmas in July theme. August will feature Moana. And then in September, we'll feature Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So it's a, it's a good range of movies for you know all ages, very family friendly. And we really look forward to welcoming everyone to Booth Park to enjoy these movies outdoors this summer. And so what are the times on these events? Because of course in the summer, it, it's lighter later. So when do these movies begin being shown in Booth Park? Yeah, so 6.30, you should plan to arrive at Booth Park at 6.30 p.m. for the pre-show entertainment. Um, which varies depending on you know which movie we have, so you can find that information on our website. And then also, um, you know, we have that LED screen this year, so we'll actually be starting the movie at 7:30 p.m. 
We're joined by Erica Bassett, PR specialist with the city of Birmingham and the Birmingham Shopping District. Joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. More information can be found on their website, allinbirmingham.com. That's allinbirmingham.com. More information on their shops, on dining options, on certain services you can get in, in downtown Birmingham, what to do, places you can visit, more information for businesses, and of course, information on all their events, including their movie night series at Booth Park all throughout the summer with entertainment beginning at 6.30 p.m. All in Birmingham. Dot com is the website all in Birmingham dot com. And so earlier this month uh, in, in May marked the return of the Birmingham Farmers Market. Tell us about the excitement that's going to be there this summer and, and the variety of vendors that people can uh, experience and, and can, of course, shop with at Birmingham's Farmers Market. I do actually asked about that because we are celebrating our 20th season this year at the Birmingham Farmers Market. Uh, it's been a community tradition for so many years, and many of our vendors have actually um, started with us 20 years ago at the market. So it's really fun to see the relationships that they've built with the community. And then, of course, we have you know new vendors that join us each year. But we have about 35 vendors each week, and they sell um, just so many different items, but locally grown produce, uh, everything is locally grown, Michigan grown. Um, we have organic meats and eggs, artisan cheeses, baked goods, including homemade breads, cookies, um, really anything that, that you can enjoy. And then we also have vendors that offer uh, garden plants, unique floral bouquets, and just many other wonderful pots and plants for your porches and gardens. Um, in the in the late summer, um, one of the things that's a favorite is the fresh roasted corn. So when that becomes in season, more like August, September, um, that's always a favorite. We have the corn roasters there every week. And if you're not familiar with our market, it is an outdoor market. And so each week we have live music, we have a kid zone with crafts and activities for the kids. And then we also have several food trucks um, with both sweet and savory options. So you can grab lunch while you're there. And then um, new this year, on the second Sunday of each month, we have a fitness activity starting at the top of the hour. And that'll be hosted by one of our local gyms. So I really, if you haven't been to the farmer's market or if you have been and it's been a while, I recommend you know coming back this year because we really have a lot planned. And the market runs every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that's May through October. And that is located in downtown Birmingham at public parking lot six, which is at 660 North Old Woodward Avenue, uh, right across from Booth Park in downtown Birmingham. So if you wanna come down, even bring the kids, they can participate in Kids Zone while you shop at the market. And then you can even head over to Booth Park or grab rest, you know, something at one of the restaurants for lunch. Um, it's just, it's a great way to spend a Sunday. And that information can also be found on our website, allinbirmingham.com slash farmers market. Allinbirmingham.com is their website for more information on the Farmer's Market, on other events, and all their shops and dining options in downtown Birmingham. We're joined by Erica Bassett, PR specialist with the City of Birmingham, and in particular, the Birmingham Shopping District, joining us on the program. And so, uh, any other upcoming events that people should be looking forward to or looking for more information in the coming uh, days and weeks if they're interested in exploring everything Birmingham has to offer this summer? Yeah, so again, you can see everything on our a couple of events that I think people would really enjoy. So uh, Day on the Town is on uh, Saturday, July 30th, and that's the biggest sidewalk sale of the year. We typically have over 65 retailers that participate in that, and it's just a great, great day to come out and enjoy wonderful deals, fun entertainment. It's good for all ages, um, but if you love to shop, that's definitely a great event that you'll want to mark your calendar for. That runs 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and during that day, we typically have free parking in the structures, so you don't have to worry about that time limit or anything. Um, just come park and enjoy the day with us. And then, of course, the Woodward Dream Cruise is always a big event in this general area, and we have a Birmingham Cruise event that will be happening on August 20th alongside the Woodward Avenue Dream Cruise from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then the city of Birmingham offers the In the Park Summer Concert Series, and that is happening in Shane Park every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. starting mid-June, and that runs through August. And actually, the website's a little different for that one, but that information can be found at behamgov.org slash summer concerts. And then... Yep. Yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say the other two events can be found on our website, the allinbirmingham.com. 
the two websites are behamgov.com uh, and, uh, and all in Birmingham. Dot com for more information on everything happening in Birmingham, in the shopping district, and in the city proper. All those can be found on their websites. Erica, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree. Know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. 72.7% of high school students get less than the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. This can cause pain, obesity, and can very negatively affect your mental health. When you have a consistent seven to nine hours of sleep every day, you get sick less often, lose more weight, and have better relationships with those around you. <laughs> For more information about the dangers of sleep deprivation, go to sleepfoundation.org. This message is brought to you by the WBHS Digital Media Arts Program in 89.3 Lakes FM. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water, and so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. with food, health care, mental health, and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. Michigan Megacast on your radio homes for the Megacast 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. I'm Tyler Keith. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link where you'll find more information on all of our partnering stations including My Michigan TV. Joining us now is Alan Boatwright. He is a painter and otherwise known as the International Painter of Rust. And you'll see him this year at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, uh, July 21st through 23rd in downtown Ann Arbor, 30 blocks of Ann Arbor, a thousand plus artists that you'll be able to join all the way down in Ann Arbor this summer. Alan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Appreciate having you on. So first of all, just uh, give us a little bit of background on uh, yourself and the art that you do and how you got into painting well I, I started rather young I was um, about eight years old and um, 
started doing fruit and vases and, or fruit and bowls. I, the only access I had to how to draw was uh, we'd go to the store. At that time, it was Kmart. And they had learned to draw books by John Gangi. And my parents would buy me those books. And the only thing he showed how to draw at that time was bowls of fruit. So I started with bowls of fruit. And, and um, then I just I kept drawing. My parents kept buying me more art supplies and better books. And pretty soon I was drawing people and things. And um, it just took off from there. So did you begin your journey as a full-time artist? Did you begin on a part-time basis? How did you turn this into a business and a career? Well, um, my jobs have always been art-related. I started my very first job. I was working at an art supply store. And then uh, from there, uh, worked for the Air Force as a technical illustrator, started my own ad agency, that turned into a sign business, and then that turned into a clothing business, primal wear, bicycling apparel, and um, and then that turned into this because I wanted to uh, do more with my art than just commercials and things like that. So it it really um, transformed over the years. I wish I would have started the painting part of my life a lot sooner. So, Alan, you mentioned you, were a, you mentioned you were a technical illustrator for the Air Force. What was that job like? Because I, I, mean, I think when we think of the Air Force, generally when people think of that, they don't really, their mind doesn't really go to illustration as being a critical part of that. So what role did you play in that? <clears throat> well, um, when you're new, you're the, you're the new guy in the art department, you uh, do a lot of name tags for doors, you know, Colonel Sanders' office or whatever. Um, but as you get more um, fluent and they can see what it is you do, you might illustrate the front page of the newspaper or um, you might uh, start drawing various jets for uh, the student pilots to get when they graduate. Uh, if you get an F-16, you get a nice drawing of an F F-16. And, and uh, it, it's, a lot of it is pretty darn boring. You know, a lot of it is technical like wiring diagrams for a fighter bomber 111, you know, or a B-1 bomber cockpit. But it honed uh, my technical skills, my, my sense of detail. Um, and uh, it was very educational. And I also, I, I serve multi-purposes there. I, I also did uh, photography and videography for the Air Force. We're drawn by Alan Boatwright, he is a painter that will be seen at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair. You can join him there July 21st through 23rd in downtown Ann Arbor. 30 blocks of the city will be taken up by this art show. You can learn more information by visiting the art show's website, theannarborartfair.com. That's theannarborartfair.com for more information, and you can learn more about Alan and his works by visiting ironplanetstudios.com. That's ironplanetstudios.com for more information on Alan and all of his artwork. And so you grew up in Flint. You're from Michigan. How did your upbringing uh, inspire your art? You mentioned some of uh, your drawing as a kid and how that really led you into this passion. But what other, in what other ways did your upbringing in Flint inspire your art or continue to inspire your art today? Well, um, I was a scrawny kid. <laughs> I was really small. When I graduated high school, I weighed 103. So um, in Flint, where I was, um, it could be pretty rough. The neighborhood was pretty rough. So you either fought or you found a skill of some sort. And my skills were not in fighting. <laughs> uh, so I drew a lot. And by drawing, um, you become, you're almost as popular as a quarterback, <laughs> you know. High school is everything for popularity, and you got to find your your place. And I just accidentally became an artist young, and by the time I was in high school, I was the king artist, so to speak. And um, uh, it, it, I found solitude in it, you know. When when you can't really enjoy going outside because of various things going on in that area. Um, 
<clears throat> I found solitude in sitting on my bed and drawing. And uh, that became my escape. Still is. Still is. We're joined by Alan Boatwright. He is a painter joining us on the, on the Michigan MegaCast. Mega you can find him at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair. July 21st through 23rd in Ann Arbor. Uh, Thursday, July 21st and Friday, July 22nd, 10 a.m. until 9 p.m. And then Saturday, July 23rd, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. 30 blocks of downtown Ann Arbor will be taken up by this art show. And you can see Alan and many other artists there. Learn more information, theannarborartfair.com. And so you've been doing art shows since 2015. What in, what got you into doing art shows, and what about art shows keeps you continuing to go to them with your art, to sell your art, and to help people learn more information about your art? Well, um, I got into it accidentally. I was uh, We had bought a house in Florida, and I wanted to do some beachy art. I wanted beachy art, uh, and I looked for beachy art, but I couldn't find anything oddball enough. And we really wanted the house to kind of have an odd um, be an, it'd be an unusual experience for whoever came to it. A little cutting edge, a little uh, high tech, and uh, to go with high tech, we needed robots. So I, I did some robots lounging on the beach and pulling up their bikinis and, uh, you know, broken leg from playing volleyball on the beach. It was called spring break. Um, and, uh, and it kind of took off from there. I, I, after I got the house decorated, I had a friend uh, tell a gallery that I was an artist. And then she showed some photos on her phone to the gallery owner who said that I should be in the gallery. And then uh, I put some pieces in the gallery, one first place. And then she suggested that I do some shows. So we started doing shows, but I really felt like the art needed to needed to tell a story. So I figured out that by using the robots, I could disarm people enough that they they didn't see the sex of the robot, the race of the robot, the religion of the robot or whatever, but then I could tell a story like, uh, uh, I don't know, I could tell a story about uh, Elon Musk without him knowing it was Elon Musk, or I could tell a story about Jackie Robinson without any clue that it was gonna be about Jackie Robinson. Well, there are clues, but most people aren't finding them. So it became a kind of a hide and seek game. And I liked that, it, you know, it, I liked the whole theme of you can't judge a book by its cover. So art typically is very subjective. You might like it because it's red. You might like it because it, it doesn't have a shape or form, or you might like it because it's very illustrative, but with my art, I have three kinds of fans. I have the children love it. Then I have adults that like it because it's funny. And then I have the art connoisseur that sees the intellect in it and really identifies with the, the hidden values of the painting. So with all that meaning that goes into these paintings, with all of that intent that goes into it, where do you draw that inspiration, painting to painting, and then what is your process from point A to point Z in having this idea generated in your head and then putting that onto a canvas, drawing it, and painting it? That's, that's a hard one to explain. I, I, um, I've tried several times. It typically starts out with a, with a little sketch. And just to give you an example, mm -hmm. I'll pull one out of my book here. It's just... I have this idea of two robots doing a deal in the back alley, trading batteries for uh, uh, cash, C-A-C-H-E. And then that evolved into making it a little funnier, putting Darth Vader being the one selling the robots, uh, selling the robot batteries. And then that culminated with this drawing of Darth Vader in the alley. And then during all of this sketching, drawing, painting, um, stuff started happening in the news. For instance, Prince was very anti-drugs, alcohol, but he died of a, it, at first they said a Percocet overdose, later it was fentanyl. So it made me think maybe the subject matter of this painting should go down 
um, the road of addiction, addicted to power, the robot is, but how about addiction that isn't drugs or alcohol, that's, but is just as harmful like money, power, uh, greed, um, love, uh, things that take your focus off of all your friends and concentrate it on one thing to your detriment. And that's what that painting became. It sounds like it's a dark, oh, let me see if I can get out of the way. See it back there? Sounds like it's a dark um, uh, concept, this, but it, it actually uh, enlightens people that it isn't just drugs and alcohol you can be addicted to. Today, it's your cell phone. It's, it's the internet. It, it, you know, you, it can really take your focus off of the people around you that, that need you. We're joined by Alan Boatwright, painter who you will see at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd, joining us on the Mega Casher, known also as the International Painter of Rust. Can you explain that moniker to us and, and where that came from? Well, um, as, as stated earlier, I grew up in Flint. And when I was a little kid, <clears throat> Flint was booming. It was a booming town and everything was happening there. I mean, the best cars being built, everything. But then we hit 1973, that America hit kind of a speed bump with oil. And uh, it was determined America's cars were too big. And people started buying Hondas and uh, Datsuns and uh, you know various other foreign cars. And the American auto industry took a, a big hit. And my father worked for the American auto industry. And I watched our neighborhood decay into a point, to a point of uh, nobody wanted to live there. None of us wanted to live there, but that's where we were. And they closed, uh, I lived right near the gas tank assembly uh, plant, about two stones throws away. That closed. Um, I watched the city just kind of decay. So when I started painting, before I started painting robots and rusty things, I painted rusty American automobiles, like a 59 Cadillac rusting away in a field. And, and the thought I had behind that was, this was once a cherished car to somebody. I mean, it was the best car there was. You'd go over railroad tracks at 20 mile an hour and not even feel them, or go over them at 60 mile an hour and not even feel it. It was a plush car. And to see it rotting in a field was just a um, kind of a summation of what I was seeing happening to Flint. And it, it's heartbreaking. And I painted a lot of uh, broken down buildings with boarded up windows and neon signs that were broke and rusty cars. And, and now my robots, usually they're all rusty. <laughs> all my robots are rusty because it was once a child's toy that brought so much joy, but now it's broken. It doesn't work anymore. The wires inside corroded or batteries corroded. And uh, what was once loved is no longer held in that same regard. So that's kind of where the rust came from. We're joined by Alan Boatwright. He is a painter that you will see at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd. More information on the Art Fair at theannarborartfair.com. You can also learn more about Alan and his work at ironplanetstudios.com. Alan, just another couple minutes before we'll say goodbye today. Before we let you go, I uh, just want to give you a, a chance to say anything else that we haven't just, uh, talked about today or anything else that would be important for our audience to know about your work and what they'll see from you at Ann Arbor's Art Fair. Well, um, I think the Ann Arbor show, if you've never been to it, you need to go. Uh, it is enlightening for, uh, for all people. I mean, there, everything around you, it sometime was designed by somebody, whether it's just the walls of your house or the windows that you look out of, everything was designed by an artist. And it's really a um, neat experience to go to an art show and see so many different versions of art. I mean, it can be pottery, it can be uh, things assembled from junk, it can be a painting, it can be, uh, abstract or very, very hyper-realistic. 
it's just amazing to see what other people can do. And it's very inspiring. And if you have children, I, I highly recommend it because that's kind of how I got started with my parents was seeing art. Um, they couldn't explain it to me, but that left a wide open uh, alley for my mind to run. Alan, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. You can find Alan at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd in Ann Arbor, 30 blocks of the city with over a thousand artists participating in this year's event, July 21st and 22nd, 10 a.m. until 9 p.m. July 23rd, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. More information, the Ann Arbor Art Fair .com. We're going to take a break on the Michigan Megacast. When we come back, we'll talk about summer activities for the kids in the metro Detroit area and, of course, in the city with Fred Hunter from the Detroit, from Detroit PAL. That's coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Most of the pollution that goes into our rivers is carried by rainwater that flows off of roads, parking lots, and rooftops. The leaves and bark of a single tree can retain a surprising amount of rainwater. Depending on its size and species, it could be 100 gallons or more. It is estimated that an urban forest can reduce annual runoff by up to 7%. Here's one thing that we know can help keep our water clean. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's the second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org.
Joining us now is the executive director of Detroit PAL, one of almost 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. Fred Hunter is live with us now on the Megacast. Fred, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, honor for the opportunity to uh, to have a conversation. Yeah, appreciate everyone. So first off, can you tell us about the Detroit Police Academic League and, and its history? Yeah, no, I'd be glad to. Uh, you know, Detroit Power was started in uh, 1969. So, so, you know, the folks. Net service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program, and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was going to die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom, and then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not get your vaccine? I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Joining us now is the executive director of Detroit PAL, one of almost 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. Fred Hunter is live with us now on the Megacast. Fred, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, honor for the opportunity to uh, to have a conversation. Yeah, appreciate everyone. So first off, can you tell us about the Detroit Police Academic League and, and its history? Yeah, no, I'd be glad to. Uh, you know, Detroit Power was started in uh, 1969. So you know, the focus is the uh, the mission. You know, we were are in partnership with the uh, the community volunteers and Detroit Police Department uh, to help young people find their greatness through uh, athletic and youth enrichment programs. And uh, the history, you know, started with uh, Detroit Police Department wanting to, you know, really bring things together in the community in the uh, late 60s and uh, the powerful platform of sports and working in the community is what started us and that's what we're doing now. And, and, and so uh, what does your partnership with the police department look like at, at this time and how does that partnership benefit the programs that you're providing in the community? Yeah, it's uh, it stems from the the lead the um, the leadership. So when you talk about you know Detroit Pal and uh, you know my history, but specifically uh, Chief James White and the other uh, leaders, you know they believe in community policing and the power of having police officers in uh, you know as positive role models for young people. You know focused on on the uh, the kids in the community and what they do and what they can become. And it not only helps the perspective of young people, it also helps the perspective of all 
officers, you know, to see children from a youth development standpoint. So uh, that partnership has been uh, strong over our history. Uh, we actually have uh, three, uh, four full-time DPD officers on staff with us, and uh, they are youth development officers. They're actually interacting with young people, serving as mentors, teaching our great model, um, and helping uh, young people to, to be their best and to find their greatness. We're joined by Fred Hunter, the executive director of the Detroit Police Academic League, or Detroit PAL, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. You can find more information on Share Detroit's website at sharedetroit.org by searching in their Find a Nonprofit se section for Detroit PAL or D Detroit Police Academic League and learn more. So what are some of the different athletic leagues and, and other programs that are provided through Detroit PAL in the local area? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. We offer uh, kind of two primary platforms. So one is our athletics and the sports program. So we offer, you know, 12 different sports for youth ages uh, four to 18, and they range the gamut, you know, from soccer and volleyball, cheer, football, uh, basketball, track and field. So uh, sports is a big hook. You know, young people are interested in sports and you can learn life lessons. Uh, we actually teach the uh, great model, you know, through our sports programs, you know, the G is for goal setting, R is resilience, E embracing a healthy lifestyle, A is accountability, and T is teamwork. And these are well-researched um, but important life lessons for young people to learn through sports and also through our youth enrichment programs as well. So we have a variety of things that we integrate with our sports program and that we do separately on the youth enrichment side just to help young people be exposed to new ideas, um, you know, new academic opportunities and uh, new ways for them to, you know, see the greatness inside. We're joined by Fred Hunter, the executive director of Detroit Police Academic League, or Detroit PAL, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information can be found on their website as well at DetroitPAL.org. That's Detroit, P-A-L. Dot org for more information or visit sharedetroit.org as well. So tell us more about the youth enrichment programs and, and some of what, that in, what, what those entail and how they can also provide benefit to kids in the Detroit area. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because everyone's known us for uh, sports and sports is enough in terms of what you can learn, but what we realize is young people need um, more just in terms of, uh, you know, where they are and where they can be. You know, I'll take one example is literacy. You know, most of the youth, 80% plus that we're serving are in the city of Detroit. And the literacy rates in terms of reading level at, at the third grade um, is, uh, is very challenging. So what we understand is like for our uh, little Hoopers program for four to eight year olds, not only are we teaching them lessons through sport, but we actually have a books before ball component where we can focus in on literacy, increasing their love of reading, um, you know, teach them, you know, expose them to great books so they can uh, see more in themselves. So youth enrichment brings in literacy. We have uh, STEM programs, including uh, drones and ecotech science, and they also exposure into uh, to colleges and to um, to a variety of uh, mentorships and financial literacy. So there are a lot of opportunities to integrate with our sports programs, but also to focus in on the exposures that can help young people see more of them, more from themselves and more for the future. More information on DetroitPAL.org. That's DetroitPAL.org for more information. Uh, and so if, if parents are interested in signing their kids up for these programs, whether it be the sports, the youth enrichment, or, or combinations of both, how can they go about doing so? What age range of, of kids are these programs for? Yeah, the, the range is from uh, four to, uh, to 18. We have a real strong concentration from about four to 15. Uh, what we've done, we just recently redesigned our website. So if you want to see, uh, a cool website that just uh, exemplifies kind of the culture, the passion, the excitement we have about city and about uh, being a youth development organization. You can go to DetroitPAL.org, and uh, through that, there's actually a place where you can see events and it lists all the different programs we have. Those uh, sports programs that are running now and they're registering for now, and then the youth enrichment programs as well. And it's it's also we list other community things that we're doing. We've got a, a KFC promo on there, so you know we're working about 50 different uh, KFC franchises around uh, the Metro Detroit area that are actually offering uh, savings books for well, only a dollar. You get thirty dollars in savings, but those those dollars contribute directly to Detroit PAL and helps us keep the cost low, but still add a tremendous amount of value to what we're able to give uh, young people in our programs. 
We're joined by Fred Hunter, the executive director of Detroit PAL, joining us on the Megacast. It's the, the Detroit Police Academic League. You can learn more information by visiting sharedetroit.org and clicking on their uh, Find a Nonprofit link and searching Detroit Police Academic League or Detroit PAL, or by visiting Detroit PAL's website at DetroitPAL.org. That's Detroit PAL. Dot org. Uh, you also have a really fun event coming up. You have a golf outing that will be coming up soon. Can you tell us uh, about that golf out outing and how people can participate if they'd like to do so? Yeah, the, the golf outing we have is related to Paul W. Uh, Smith. So he has been a longtime supporter for, you know, um, probably about 15 years. You know, he's just dedicated, you know, his time and energy and resources to doing a, a great golf, uh, golf outing every year. So uh, this year is July 11th. Um, and it's just an opportunity for corporations, you know, to uh, to contact us if they're interested in having a foursome or sponsoring a hole or you know being a support. It's over at the uh, Detroit Golf Club, so you know, right in the uh, the city, there, Seven Mile and Woodward area. It's a great day. It's a lot of fun. Um, but the dollars go to help us and similar nonprofits to uh, to further our missions. We're joined by Fred Hunter. He is the executive director of the Detroit Police Academic League. Joining us on the MegaCast. More information on their website, DetroitPAL.org. That's DetroitPAL.org for more information. Or visit SharedDetroit.org to learn more as well. And so we're heading into the summer months. School's about to be out for most kids are, and families are looking for summer programs that are enriching for their education, uh, get them more socialized while they're over the summer months, keep them off the couch and away from those screens as much as they possibly can and keep them active. So for those that may be interested in, in some of those programs, what sort of summer programs are offered by Detroit PAL? Yeah, a couple of things I'll mention. We have a, a Girls Changing the Game initiative. So, so what we understand is uh, when you're doing sports or any program, sometimes, especially with sports, there's interest for boys to sign up, but the research shows that young girls that are in the sports programs actually help to develop even more sometimes than young boys and become those future leaders. We like to say girls who are changing the game become women who change the world. So we've got right now a girls empowerment series um, that's happening here in uh, May and June. Uh, we've got football and cheer registration as well. You know, where not only are they uh, learning skills in athletics, but also have competitions related to that. Um, we have a great camp. It's called the Lab Camp up at North Northwood University, where we're teaching uh, young people all the principles of starting a business. Um, and learning from professors at Northwood University. So that's something that's also on our website. So for sports programs, Tiny Tigers, baseball, softball program as well, played at the corner ballpark here in Detroit where the old Tigers legends played. You know, we had that as one of our home facilities. So a lot on the sports side, a lot on the uh, youth enrichment side as well. More information can be found on DetroitPAL.org. That's DetroitPAL.org to learn more about the Detroit Police Academic League, including all of their summer programs coming up and get signed up for them as well, as well as all those fun events, including their golf outing, which, as Fred said, will be on July 11th of this year and is in partnership with Paul W. Smith and a great fundraiser for the Detroit Police Academic League. Fred, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, and so I want to give you an opportunity if there's anything that we haven't discussed uh, that the people should be aware of or may be interested in learning about the Detroit Police Academic League or should be keeping an eye out for in the near future? Yeah, a couple of things, you know, just understanding uh, in our 53 years of uh, history, we served over 400,000 participants. And uh, that doesn't include the, uh, you know, the parents and the volunteers and the family members and the friends. So there's a lot to, uh, to what we do, but man, we're more excited about the next 400,000 that we can serve through our programs. And, you know, for us, even a small amount goes a long way. You know, the KFC uh, promotion that's going through May, you know, for a dollar, that investment in all the KFC stores that are supporting this, you know, it helps us in terms of our mission. So, so every dollar is important too us and we just appreciate the uh, the community support you know things that um, you know when you talk about share Detroit and the 300 nonprofits the way we get things done is through the support of, of others you know there's no mission without the money so even small amounts five dollars a month can help and uh, make great things happen so we just uh, appreciate people knowing what we've done what we're looking to do and uh, you know excited if they can support us as well Fred thank you so much for joining us yeah thank you much Tyler appreciate it a message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. 
but you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is the source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left. Make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. If you are struggling to afford internet service for your household, there is a new government program that may be able to help. It's called the Affordable Connectivity Program and it provides up to a $30 monthly discount to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash ACP or call toll free at 877-384-2575. That's 877-384-2575. The Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission has more information. Visit GWBCable.org. Welcome back to the Michigan Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. To learn more about the program by visiting our website at civiccentertv.com and clicking on our Megacast link where you'll find more information on our entire network of stations, including My Michigan TV, which you can find more information on, including how to download their free smartphone and smart TV apps and take us with you anywhere all the time, including your home and on the road at My Michigan TV's website, MyMyTV.com. Joining us now is one of over a thousand artists that you will see at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd in downtown Ann Arbor. Armando Pedrosa joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Armando, Everybody. thanks for being with us today. No, thank you for having me. Pretty excited. Never did this before. Yeah, appreciate having you on. So first off, uh, give us a little bit of insight on uh, your work and on the art that you produce and how you got into this as a, as a career. Well, it happened actually, believe it or not, after 9-11. So I've been doing it 20 years full time, but um, I had a corporate job for 20 some years and then 9-11 happened and they laid me off because they actually restructured all the, a lot of companies were restructuring. And so they um, let me off and then I kept hearing 
a voice. And so I said, okay, God, if this is you, then I need to um, start painting because the voice was paint, paint, paint. And, um, and I'd never painted before. So it was kind of crazy. So I said, okay, God, if this is you, um, I need to sell a painting in seven weeks. And I ended up selling five. So it was like, that was all the affirmation I needed. And that was 20 years ago. So, wow, so it was kind of fun. That's that's a hell of a way to start a career I know, right? in art. That's what, we, we talked to a lot of these artists that are going to be at the Ann Arbor Art Fair. We're trying to talk to all of them, but there's a thousand of them, so that's probably not going to happen. Uh, but this is probably the most interesting beginning to a story I, I've heard of anyone's art journey. You also uh, worked a, a corporate job in Chicago, and so being a full-time artist uh, and working in that and working that job, how did that help to really inspire your passion for the art as you realized that this could be a full-time career for you? Well, I, I mean, I won best art student in fifth grade and then nothing till I was 42. Um, and it was just like I had picked up again and just I just started painting and I just I loved it. I mean, the first paintings I was doing was caricatures of homes. And then I actually took those and I hand delivered them to um, real estate offices and asked them if they would buy them as a closing gift. And within a month, I was in the Chicago Tribune and um, it was it was crazy. Business started taking off. So we talked so. to a number of painters, Armando, and everyone has a different style. Some have a really different form. We've talked to people that uh, do traditional painting, to those that have worked with spray paint. What kind of painting do you do? Is it a variety or do you have a specific form? I have total variety because since I don't know what I can't paint, since I'm self-taught, I do everything. I do everything from mixed media paintings, which all mixed media is, is you're using more than just paint. So I'll use roofing tar and plasters and I'll use different metals and found objects, um, everything. And then to chalk paints, to spray paints. So um, it's, just, oh, I'm doing sculpture, playing with some wood, so woodworking. So it's a blast. I just like challenging myself and seeing what else I, can do. And I think that some of the works behind you, and for those that are listening on the radio version, you can, of course, see this interview on demand on our website sometime this afternoon on civicsoundtv.com slash megacast. And there's such a great variety there as well of, of composition from, uh, from landscape pictures to, uh, to, to characters to faces. And, and so as you are creating these pieces, where do you start? in your process because you have such variety in the media that you use you have such variety in the in the kinds of paintings that you create so where does that process start creatively for you before it goes into fruition as a full full-fledged painting the caricatures that you're seeing behind me the the jester is is the poster that was picked by ann arbor to be um the poster it was created during COVID because everything was so dark and lonely and you couldn't see your friends. And I wanted to start painting something with a lot of colors. And so the gesture here represents, you know, the shoulders raised. It's like, now what do we do? You know? And so again, I decided I wanted to um, start painting something different that I'd never painted before. And then if you look close, there's a, a little card and it's the King of Hearts. And it's all about following your heart and listening to, um, just like I did with 9-11, where it basically, you know, tragedy hit and like, okay, how am I going to be inspired to do something else with my life? And so the same thing with COVID, I tried a whole new body of work that's been incredibly successful. So for you now, you are a traveling artist too. You go to art shows, you go to art festivals, such as I the do. Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd. What about that uh, lifestyle and, and, and going to diff these different festivals, meeting so many different art lovers and, and different artists across the, the country and across the region? How does that inspire you going forward to continue to create your art and uh, come up with new ideas for paintings? Well, there's so many great aspects to it. I mean, first of all, you get to travel, so you're not totally in the studio alone all the time. Um, I've met lifetime customers now because they'll have, they'll buy one and then they'll watch the different styles come up, so they buy others. Um, you know, you're constantly meeting new artists with new, new styles, and it's fun to be inspired by them. Um, and then again, the travel aspect, it's a blast. So, except at a show when it rains, then. It's not as fun, but 
Yeah, Rain and Paint the, aren't very good friends. No, 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 no. We're joined. But also the fun thing, Tyler, too, is is you're your own boss, so I get to pick my own shows and travel where I want to travel, and and I didn't realize that corporate. I just didn't. I didn't like the nine to five being told what to do kind of a thing. I'm a kind of a free spirit artist. <laughs> We're joined by Armando Pedrosa. He is the featured artist of the Summer Art Fair, which is part of the Ann Arbor Art Fair. More information on theannarborartfair.com. You can also find Armando's art on his website, armandopedrosa.com. That's armandopedrosa.com for more information on his art and to in, uh, inquire about, about acquiring some of his art pieces. If you're unable to attend this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, which Hopefully you are able to, to attend. you got plenty of time to move your schedule around. July 21st through 23rd in downtown Ann Arbor, 30 blocks of the city. Over a 1,000 artists, including their Summer Art Fair featured artist, Armando Pedrosa, who's with us on the Michigan Megacast. And so on that, you're this year's Summer Art Fair featured artist. For you, Armando, as someone uh, who lives in Michigan and someone who has been to this Ann Arbor Art Fair before, what does that mean to you to be the featured artist of this art fair within the Ann Arbor Art Fair? It was an it's an honor because the again like you were just saying there's a thousand artists there so for for them to choose me was um, I was just taken aback so very very excited and thrilled and and honored so we're joined by Armando Pedrosa he is a painter and this year's of course as we said summer art fair featured artist at the Ann Arbor Art Fair more information on the Ann Arbor Art Fair all of its auxiliary art fairs within the art fair and other entertainment July 21st through 23rd by visiting their website at the Ann Arbor Art Fair Dot com. That's the Ann Arbor Art Fair dot com. And just diving more into this specific art fair and this, these specific shows, Armando, what about Ann Arbor and, and its art fair and, and its customer base there and just the community of art lovers in Michigan keeps you coming back to the Ann Arbor Art Fair? Well, Tyler, just like you said, it, it is a community of art lovers. You can. There's a lot of shows that they do around the country and a lot of people, I don't want to... They may not totally understand art, but they seem to understand it at Ann Arbor, and they seem to come back and they follow you, um, and it's well run. I work. Um, my section is the Guild, and I mean they're incredible in the quality of the artists that they get there, and it's also a huge inspiration for me to be around such great artists. It pushes me to be like a better artist. And, and so let's dive in more into those relationships. How important for artists like you and for other artists, whether they're painters or they create another form of art, how important are those relationships that you do develop at these art shows? Not just the ones that you're coming back to, but just as an artist and refining and changing and tinkering with your creative process to maybe try something different and maybe create some, some different form of art within your own art that is extraordinary. Well, art is a soul purchase to begin with. So, because I create from my soul and and some people want to get caught up in, you know, a certain name of what the art is. Is it abstract? Is it this or ever? To me, it's real simple. It's, does it, does it move your your soul? Do you, how do you feel? And even if people don't, you know, care for my work, if I can invoke some sort of an emotion, then I did my job. But um, I always sign the back of my paintings from my soul to yours. Because again, we're we're connecting at a not an not an intelligent level, but at a heart level, which is really um, if you're going to be a successful artist, you need you need that, and you also need to have a story behind your paintings. Like you asked earlier, it's like what what was I thinking when I was creating this painting? How did it start? And it's and people want to know that story. If so many people can sell their art on the web or can put their art. And get get their art into a gallery and, and sell it through sure. that mode. The art show method is really different because it's so tangible. You're interacting with the people that you're ultimately selling this art art to. For you, how does that add to the magic and and the satisfaction that you feel in creating this art? To then see where your piece is, where all of that labor that you put in, all that yeah. love you put into this piece is ultimately going, and seeing that reaction from these people as they fall in love with the art that you've created. I mean, it's it's just it's that human nature. It's the, you know, like they'll give you a hug after you know they buy a painting, or they'll get tears in their eyes once you tell them the story, and um, you know, it's like what it means to them, and uh, that is you can't put 
you can't put a price on that. I had a little boy last last week at an art show. He's maybe five years old, and he went. He loved the art so much in my booth that he went home and he created a painting for me, and he made his father come back the next day. I cried, and so I gave him one of my paintings just to inspire him to you know to follow his art and passion and. I'm a businessman, so I love when I get sales on the internet and through my galleries. But again, Tyler, there's nothing like um, interacting with people. You can see Armando Pedrosa and all of his art at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd. More information is theannarborartfair.com. Uh, Thursday, July 21st, and Friday, July 22nd. The hour is 10 a.m. until 9 p.m. And Thursday, and then sorry, Friday, uh, Saturday, one of those days, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. Again, more information on theannarborartfair.com. You can also learn more about Armando and all of his work by visiting armandopedrosa.com as well. Armando, uh, just a few more minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, I want to give you a chance to preview. We saw some of the pieces behind you, but I want to give you a chance to speak more on those pieces and others that you plan to showcase at this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair in case people are interested in stopping by your booth. Well, um, I moved to Michigan in um, 2018. I had just turned 60 and was, I think I had enough on the on, on Chicago. I was like, I decided to leave it to the the a younger generation so anyway i bought a blueberry farm up here and so my new series of paintings has become these beautiful uh, realistic barn series that um they're now you know there's kind of a wait list on on getting them so those will be featured at the ann arbor show uh again the caricature kind of people that i did um during the COVID series, those will be shown. And I will have just a couple abstracts. So there'll be a little bit for everybody. And um, I hope you come. Yeah, and Armando, just want to ask you about this piece uh, behind you, right over your right shoulder there, because it caught my eye, because I have uh, some family okay. that uh, is in the Air Force. And so I see uh, what looks like, uh, uh, the red shirt kind of looks like the, the stripes on the American flag, the blue bird sort of looks like, of course, the, the blue section behind the uh, stars on the flag, and then you have the airplane behind us. Tell us more about this painting. What what inspired you in, in this, and what, what uh, meaning you are hoping to get out of a painting like that? Um, the painting is called um, uh, Birds of a Feather, and um, just to show the different passions that people have in different groups, um, you know, whether it's running or biking or um, whatever. And I just, I just thought it was a really fun image to, to try to create. Yeah, a lot of great detail in there, and and uh, it's really a unique and interesting painting, as as all those that we see behind you. And you, of course, you can see all those paintings either on this interview but right behind Armando at civiccentertv.com slash megacast on his website at armandopedrosa.com or by visiting him at the Ann Arbor Art Fair July 21st through 23rd in Ann Arbor. 30 blocks of the city, over a thousand artists, including Armando Pedrosa, who's with us on the Michigan Megacast. Armando, before we let you go, anything else that you'd like to talk about today or anything else we haven't touched on about your art or this year's Ann Arbor Art Fair? Just I hope everybody comes because it's and bring your kids. Um, it's a great way to expose, you know, children to to art. And um, the fun thing about the Ann Arbor Art Festival is there's every kind of media that you you want. There's everything from the children's art. There's again abstract. There's painting for the children. There's watercolor. Um, there's sculpting. There's jewelry. I mean, you name it. Whatever kind of art you're into, um, it'll be there. Mondo, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time. My pleasure, Tom. Appreciate it. ArmandoPedrosa.com to keep up to date on his art and learn more about his creations. And the Ann Arbor Art Fair is the website to learn more about the Ann Arbor Art Fair July 21st and 22nd. That's Thursday and Friday, 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday, July 23rd, 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. Armando Pedrosa, of course, the featured artist of the Summer Art Fair. And there's plenty of other specific and individual art fairs within the Ann Arbor Art Fair, as well as entertainment and more. The Ann Arbor Art Fair com for more information. As I talk to more of these artists, as we're uh, continuing to partner with the Ann Arbor Art Fair to preview their upcoming shows this summer at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd. It becomes more interesting because when you really get to know the artists behind these works, you're not just seeing what they're creating, you're seeing their process. You're understanding the meaning that they're putting into it. And like Armando said, you're connecting their 
their heart to the piece and your heart to the piece. And that's how you really find a deeper meaning in each of these things. You don't have to be an art lover. You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a creative to, to appreciate art. It's really that conversation, that interaction. You're getting to know, it's a nice way to get to know some other people, some, meet some unique people from all different walks of life here in Michigan, around the US and around the world that will join you there at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, July 21st through 23rd. Again, more information on the Ann Arbor Art Fair Dot com, the Ann Arbor Art Fair dot com to keep up to date on everything about the Ann Arbor Art Fair and get yourself ready to join them there July 21st through 23rd. That's going to do it for today's edition of the MegaCast. I'd like to thank everyone that joined us on today's program, including Tony Targan and Brooke Allen from the Farmington Players, who joined us at the beginning of the Oakland County Hour, Erica Bassett from the Birmingham Shopping District, who also joined us on the program, Alan Boatwright, another artist at the Ann Arbor Art Fair, as well as Fred Hunter from Detroit Pal, and of course, Armando Pedrosa, who is the featured uh, summer art fair artist at the Ann Arbor Art Fair. You can view all these interviews and this full episode on our website sometime mid to late afternoon, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Big thank you as well to our crew that makes this program possible two hours a day, five days a week for the Oakland County Hour and the Michigan Hour of the Megacast. Calvin Brown, our technical director with me in the studio for the full broadcast each and every day. Jared Clark, our Zoom producer at the office of My Michigan TV and of course the king of television, Larry Nyland, our producer helping book these shows and make sure that the guests and us are ready for informative conversations on a number of topics every single day. On My Michigan TV, coming up next, it's Steve Lato live from noon to one. Then Larry and Ronnie live from 1 to 2 p.m. will return on Thursday morning with another edition of the Oakland County and Michigan Megacasts.